we played the Phoenix Suns, and KJ gave me 39, 9, and 9. <laughs> Kevin Johnson. Yes. Ooh. And um, and it was it, it was not off um like athletic ability or nothing like that. It was just he was just so much smarter than me. He just knew how to play the game. He was a blur on the court with the athleticism to play above the rim and put some of the greatest defenders on a highlight reel, while simultaneously being one of the best passers in league history. His ability to penetrate to the basket was second to none, and once he got into the paint, he was an elite finisher with some of the best in-air body control in NBA history. But if the defense collapsed on him, he quickly could find the open man. He was a perennial 20-10 and 10 player when he first got to Phoenix and one can't help but wonder if he could have extended those numbers even longer had he not have gone through years with serious undiagnosed injuries. Kevin Johnson was a leader of one of the most exciting eras of Suns basketball, but he was oft injured during that era, and as soon as he got healthy, his MVP running mate was gone, and then he quickly broke down. But even though he had plenty of regular seasons cut short, you could all but guarantee he'd be available for the playoffs. But it's not just that he was available, it's that he was elite as he is one of the greatest postseason performers in NBA history. Unfortunately, his best years came when Magic Johnson and Isaiah Thomas were still the league's premier point guards. Then once they slowed down, injuries, which should have been caught much earlier, stole a lot of Kevin Johnson's best basketball from him. And by the time they were remedied, his tank was almost empty. And that's part of the reason why Johnson isn't talked about nearly as much as he should be in the all-time great point guard conversation so he instead finds his name coming up often in another conversation, the one about the most underrated players of all time. So today, we're going to shine some light on the great career of KJ, Kevin Johnson. Let's jog your memory. A California native, Kevin Johnson attended Sacramento High School, where he was both a standout baseball and basketball player. Johnson would have a great senior season for the Dragons in 1983, as on top of leading the state of California in scoring with 34.2 points per game, he would be named the Northern California Player of the Year. And on the baseball diamond, he played both infield and outfield, and batted 500 as a leadoff hitter. Johnson would accept a scholarship to stay in state and play for the University of California. And on top of being a star basketball player, he would also be a four-year starter for the baseball team, and eventually be drafted by the Oakland A's. Johnson would join an average Golden Bears team coming off a 14-14 season. He would play in all 28 games during his freshman year in 1984, and would start 13 of these games, as he tied for third on the team in scoring among players who played more than five games, and was second in assists, while shooting 51% from the field. However, Cal only managed a 12-16 record this year, and would not see any postseason play, as Johnson ended his freshman season averaging about 9.5 points, 3 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. Johnson's sophomore season would see him as a starter in 25 of the 27 games he played, as he improved his numbers across the board. He would now average double figures as he finished second on the team in scoring, third in rebounding, and first in assists and steals, while shooting 45% from the field. Unfortunately, it would be another disappointing season for Cal, as they finished with another losing record at 13-15 and 15, and would again not see any postseason play. And his sophomore season would end with him averaging nearly 13 points, 4 rebounds, 4 assists, and 2 steals per game. 1986 was a breakthrough season for Johnson and Cal basketball, as they were now led by new head coach Lou Campanelli, and Johnson became the team's leading scorer as well as the team's leader in assists and steals, while shooting 49% from the field. The Golden Bears would get off to an 8-2 start before finishing the year 17-9, which included an 11-7 record in conference play. However, they would defeat rival UCLA this season for the first time in 52 games. Johnson would be recognized for his improved play, as he would be named first team all Pac-10. But the bigger accomplishment was that Johnson had led the team to its first postseason appearance in 26 years, as Cal received a berth in the NIT. Unfortunately, the celebration would be short-lived, as they would lose by 5 points to Loyola Marymount in the first round. But for Johnson's junior season, he would average about 15.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 6 assists per game. 1987 was Cal's most successful year with Johnson, as they would go 16-13 and 13 in the regular season, which included an upset win over number 20 ranked Florida. Johnson would also have the only 30 point games of his career this year, as he put up 31 versus both Stanford and USC. This season would mark the first year of the modern Pac-10 tournament format, and Johnson would help the team to a win versus Oregon State in round one, 
before losing to Reggie Miller and UCLA in the semifinals. The team would also receive their second straight NIT berth and make some noise, as Johnson would score 30 to lead the team to a first round win versus Cal State Fullerton, and then help the team beat Oregon State in the second round before losing to Little Rock in the quarterfinal, ending Johnson's season and college career. But for his senior season, he averaged about 17 points, 4 rebounds, and 5 assists, while again being named first team all Pac-10. Johnson left Cal as the program leader in points, assists, and steals. And throughout his college career, he had shown his dual threat ability, with his scoring and passing, along with his elite athleticism, helped propel him up the draft boards. Johnson would be selected 7th overall by the Cleveland Cavaliers, and his draft spot would become the reason he chose to wear number 7 throughout his career in Phoenix. But for the time being, he joined a Cavs team who featured second year point guard Mark Price. So Johnson's ceiling for the foreseeable future looked like a backup role. The Cavs featured a young core of Price, Ron Harper, and Brad Doherty. Johnson would play a limited role as part of the 10 man rotation, as he would receive about 20 minutes per game, averaging around 7 points and 4 assists in his first 52 games of the year. But with the Cavs sitting at 500 on February 28th, they made a blockbuster deal that helped them improve a lacking front court when they traded for Phoenix Suns All Star Larry Nance, as they sent Johnson, Tyrone Corbin, and Mark West, along with picks, to Phoenix. Nance had been a bright spot on a struggling Suns team for the past two years, but they hadn't been improving and were sitting at 17 and 36 at the time of the trade. Additionally, Price had developed quicker than expected and was better suited for Lenny Wilkins' half-court offense. The trade was not well received by Phoenix fans, as they were upset that newly hired head coach Cotton Fitzsimmons had just traded their best player for a few unproven role players, but it would end up being a great trade for both sides. Fitzsimmons would make Johnson an instant starter at point guard on a team led by veterans Eddie Johnson and Walter Davis. Kevin Johnson would thrive in the Suns' up-tempo offense, but they would only go 11-18 the rest of the way to finish the year at 28-54, and, and Johnson's rookie season ended with him averaging about 9 points, 5.5 assists, and 1.5 steals per game. The Suns looked much different going into 1989. The backcourt now featured Johnson and third-year shooting guard Jeff Hornacek, and the front court featured Armin Gilliam and the newly acquired all-star forward Tom Chambers, who was signed as a free agent during the offseason. Additionally, the Suns used the pick acquired in the Johnson trade to draft Dan Marley out of Central Michigan. Phoenix would have one of the fastest paced offenses in the league, as they would lead the league in scoring, and this helped them to an incredible 27-game turnaround, which included a 9-game winning streak in April as they finished the year 55 and 27. However, it was Johnson who made the biggest leap, as in year 2, he joined Magic Johnson and Isaiah Thomas as the only other players in history to average at least 20 points and 12 assists in a season, and his 12.2 assists per game would be third in the league. He would score double figures in 78 of the 81 games he played, including a 41-point performance versus the Clippers on December 3rd. He would also dish double-digit assists in 64 games, which included two games with at least 20 dimes and a February 26 loss to the Lakers in which he had 30 points and 21 assists. And lastly, he would record two triple doubles this year. He would finish third on the team in scoring, as along with Chambers and Eddie Johnson, the Suns featured three players putting up at least 20 per game. Johnson would win the Most Improved Player award, however he would not be an All-Star, as his season was such a surprise that he wasn't even listed on the All-Star ballot. The Suns returned to the playoffs for the first time in four years, and would face the Alex English-led Nuggets in the first round. This would be a quick three-game sweep for Phoenix, as Johnson would have a great postseason debut, scoring at least 26 in each game, including 30-plus point double-doubles in games 2 and 3, as he averaged over 30 points and 13 assists, along with over 2 steals for the series. Round 2 brought the Golden State Warriors, led by Chris Mullen and rookie Mitch Richmond, and the Suns would take the series in 5 games, with 3 of their wins coming by at least 12 points. Johnson's scoring would drop, but he would still play an incredible series, as he had 4 double-doubles and averaged 20 points and over 11 assists. And now the Suns were in the Western Conference Finals, where the other Johnson was waiting for them, as they took on the defending champion LA Lakers. The series would not go as the Suns hoped, as they were swept by LA. However, it was closer than it looked, as every game was decided by 8 points or less. But again, Johnson continued to play lights out as he would have a double-double in each game and never score less than 22 points or shoot less than 50% from the field. But the Lakers' championship experience proved to be the deciding factor in this series. Nonetheless, it had been a dream season in Phoenix, and it looked like there were many more to come. 
and for the regular season, Johnson averaged about 20.5 points, a career-high 12.2 assists, and all while shooting over 50% from the field, as he was named second team All-NBA. The 1990 Suns were again an elite offensive team, finishing with the second best scoring offense in the league. They featured just two players averaging at least 20 points in Johnson and Tom Chambers, who put up a career-high scoring average this year. But scoring went deep, as six players averaged double figures. Johnson again averaged over 20 points and 10 assists while shooting nearly 50% from the field as he would finish as a top 15 scorer and a top 3 distributor in the league. He would score in double figures in 67 of his 74 games, including a career-high 44 in a March 27th loss to Milwaukee. He would have 51 games with double-digit assists, 42 double-doubles, and 3 triple-doubles, as well as 2 20 and 20 games. This year, he would be on the All-Star ballot, as he would be selected to his first All-Star game and also receive another second-team All-NBA selection. The Suns would have another great regular season, finishing at 54-28, and, and would get a matchup with Utah in the first round. Johnson would have a down series by his playoff standards, as he put up just about 19 points and 9 assists per game, on less than 43% shooting. But this is a little skewed, as he played just 9 minutes, recording 0 points in Game 1 while suffering from the flu. But the Suns would win the series in 5, with Johnson putting up 26 points and 11 assists in the series deciding game. Round 2 was a chance for revenge, as Phoenix got another shot at the Lakers, and this series would go much differently. The Suns would defeat the Lakers in 5 games, as Johnson would lead the team in scoring, assists, and steals, averaging about 22 points, 11 assists, and 3 steals per game, as Johnson would record 3 double-doubles and put up 30 points and 16 assists in the series clinching Game 4. The Suns would find themselves back in the Western Conference Finals, this time versus Clyde Drexler and the Portland Trail Blazers. But it would unfortunately end the same way it did the year before, as although Phoenix was able to win two games, they would still lose the series in six. Johnson would yet again average a double-double with about 22 points and 11 assists, while also shooting nearly 54% from the field. But he would also record at least four turnovers in all but two games. However, after averaging 28 points and 15 assists in games 4 and 5, he would be forced out of game 6 in the second quarter with an injury after putting up 16 points and 6 assists in just 14 minutes of action. He would plead with Fitzsimmons to re-enter the game, but Fitzsimmons wouldn't allow it, as he didn't want to jeopardize his young star's career. And without Johnson, the Suns lost the series clinching game 6 by just 3 points. And for his regular season, Johnson would put up a career-high 22.5 points, about 11.5 assists, and 1.5 steals per game. The 91 season began with the Suns bringing back the same core, but then after 15 games, they would trade Eddie Johnson and picks to the Sonics for Xavier McDaniel in hopes of bringing in some defense and toughness. This year saw Johnson lead the team in scoring for the first time in his career, as Chambers was beginning to decline, as the previous season had been his last, averaging at least 20 points. Johnson continued his incredible play with his third straight season averaging at least 20 points and 10 assists, and would do so on a career-high 51.6% from the field. He would rank 13th in the league in scoring and 4th in assists, and he would play 77 games, and score in double figures in all but one of them. He would have at least 10 assists in 43 games, and record a 37-point, 20-assist game on April 2nd versus Utah. He would again be named second-team All-NBA, and be voted to his second straight All-Star game where he would wear number 41 instead of number 7, which announcers speculated was a way of honoring underappreciated teammate Mark West. The Suns again finish as a top team in the league at 55-27, and 27, but would not have the same playoff success that fans were growing accustomed to. They would have a first round rematch versus Utah, but would lose in 4 games, as Johnson had an uncharacteristically poor series. He would only average about 13 points and 10 assists, while barely shooting 30%. However, he would still manage to record three double-doubles in the series. But the Suns season was over much earlier than they were used to, and for the regular season, Johnson averaged about 22 points, 10 assists, and a career-high 2.1 steals per game. The Suns looked pretty much the same going into 1992, and continued to feature a great backcourt of Johnson and Hornacek, as well as sixth man Dan Marley, averaging a career-high in points and three-point percentage. But this would be Johnson's first full season with Phoenix, in which he didn't average at least 20 points. However, it would be his fourth straight year, averaging a double-double, as he finished second in the league in assists. He would still score double figures in 73 of the 78 games he played, and match his career-high of 44, the November 30th win versus Utah. He would have 44 double-doubles and one triple-double, 
and yet another 20 and 20 game in a March 31st win versus Portland. The Suns' top three offense helped them to a 53 and 29 record and another playoff berth. In the first round, they would sweep a Spurs team that was far from full strength, as starters David Robinson and Willie Anderson missed the entire series with injury, and starter Rod Strickland played the first two games before missing game three with injury, and Johnson would take advantage as he'd put up over 22 points per game on over 52% shooting and averaged 15.7 assists per game, which was a career high for a postseason series, as this would include a postseason career high of 19 assists in Game 2. The second round brought the Portland Trailblazers, who would defeat Phoenix in five games, in a series that included a double overtime thriller that saw Johnson hit a last second shot in the first overtime to tie the game and force a second overtime, where he would end up fouling out in a 153 to 151 loss. Johnson would have another great series leading his team with over 24 points per game to go along with nine assists as he would record two double doubles. However, he would go cold in game five as he would put up just 12 points and six assists on four of 13 from the field. And his regular season ended with him averaging about 19 and a half points, 10 and a half assists and one and a half steals per game. The Suns knew they were close and didn't want to miss their opportunity and there was a superstar in Philadelphia who wanted out. So on July 17th, the Suns traded a package headlined by Hornacek to the Sixers for Charles Barkley, instantly catapulting them into title favorites. And with Johnson coming off such a great stretch of high level and healthy play, the sky was the limit. Prior to the regular season, Johnson had lifted up teammate Oliver Miller during warmups of a preseason game. And uh, Miller was a big guy, as at his lightest weight, he weighed in at 280 pounds. And remember this, because it's going to come up later. Johnson would have an injury riddled year as he suffered from knee, groin and hamstring injuries, as well as a two game suspension for his involvement in a March 23rd brawl versus New York. And he would only manage 49 games for the Phoenix Suns, led by their soon to be crowned MVP in Barkley. The Suns had also made some key offseason additions, like signing veteran Danny Ainge and adding forward Richard Dumas, who had missed his rookie season due to substance abuse issues and they were all led by new head coach Paul Westfall, as Fitzsimmons had retired. Marley had been elevated to a starting role and would form a great trio with Barkley and Johnson. And even though Johnson's numbers took a big hit, it made sense as Barkley was now the focal point of the offense. And Johnson would still lead the team in assists and be quite efficient, shooting nearly 50% from the field. And even without a healthy Johnson, the Sun still dominated the regular season. En route to a league best 62 and 20 record, which included a 14-game undefeated December and another 11-game win streak late in the season. And the playoffs arrived, which was when Johnson played his best. He would miss Game 1 of the Suns' first round series versus the Lakers, which would be the only playoff game of his career that he missed, but then go on to play and start in the rest of the Suns' playoff games during their 93 Finals run. The Lakers looked to be on the verge of a major upset, as they took the first two games of the series in Phoenix, but then Phoenix would recover and win the next three to win the series. Johnson would finish second on the team in scoring, putting up about 18 points and 10 assists on nearly 53% shooting, including 24 points and 13 assists on over 62% shooting in Game 5. Round 2 brought a Spurs team with a healthy David Robinson, and even though the series was tied after 4 games, the Suns would win the next two, with Barkley hitting his legendary game winner in Game 6 to clinch the series. Johnson would again be second on the team in scoring and first in assists, while shooting over 53% from the field and would record two double-doubles in the series. The conference finals was a tough back-and-forth matchup versus Seattle, where neither team was able to win consecutive games. Johnson wouldn't play at the same level he had been, as he was defended by Gary Payton, but he would still manage about 16 points and 7 assists on a respectable 46.6% .6 shooting, as the Suns were able to outlast the Sonics and get out of the Western Conference for the second time in franchise history, but waiting for them in the finals was a Bulls team, led by Michael Jordan. Who was hungry for a third straight title. The Suns would dig themselves a deep hole as they lost both home games to start the series and then needed three overtimes to get their first win of the series in Game 3, in which Johnson played an NBA Finals record 62 minutes. This had been a much needed bounce back game for Johnson as he had scored just 15 points on a combined 6 for 21 shooting with 9 turnovers in the first two games. And even though he committed 7 turnovers this game, he still had 25 points, 7 rebounds, and 9 assists. He would play much better the remainder of the series as he would average 22 points and nearly 8 assists in games 3 through 6. But Jordan and the Bulls were just too much, as they defeated the Suns, 
and for his regular season, Johnson averaged about 16 points, 8 assists, and 1.5 steals per game. Going into 94, the Suns chose not to re-sign Chambers, but did add AC Green in the offseason, and were also getting great contributions from 4th year forward Cedric Sabalos in the 54 games he played this year. Johnson was healthier this season as he played 67 games and improved his numbers, but Barkley would miss 17 games as well this year, as his numbers took a big drop from his MVP season. But he and Johnson would combine for over 41 points and both be voted to the All-Star game, which would end up being Johnson's final All-Star appearance. Johnson would be a top 20 scorer and top 5 distributor in the league, and would record 16 double-doubles on the year, including a career-high 25 assists to go along with 16 points in an April 4th win versus San Antonio. Even with the injuries, the Suns still finished 56 and 26, and would get a first round matchup with the Golden State Warriors. Johnson would again turn in an incredible postseason, as in the Suns first round sweep of Golden State, he and Barkley would combine for 64 points per game, with Johnson putting up nearly 27 points and over 9 assists per game, including a game high 38 points in game 2. Round 2 brought MVP Hakeem Olajuwon and the Rockets. And even though the Suns stole home court advantage by going up 2-0 to begin the series, they would drop three straight before losing to Houston in Game 7. This time, Johnson would lead the team in scoring, as he again put up close to 27 points and nearly 10 assists per game, including 38 points and 12 assists in Games 3 and 4. And Game 4 would include Johnson's most famous highlight. But the Suns couldn't replicate last season and fell short of a second straight finals appearance. And for the regular season, Johnson averaged about 20 points, 9.5 assists, and 2 steals per game. Johnson would also suit up for Dream Team 2 during the 94 FIBA World Championships, where he would help lead the team to a gold medal over the summer. The 95 Suns reloaded by adding veterans Danny Manning and Wayman Tisdale in free agency, as well as drafting Wesley Person in the 94 draft. Johnson again was hampered by injuries, playing just 47 games this year, and didn't seem to be at 100% even when he did play, as he was putting up career low numbers as a starter. But the Suns were still looking like an elite team, as Danny Manning was making a huge difference as their 6th man. But then on February 7th, with the Suns sitting at 37-10, and 10, he would suffer a freak knee injury in practice that would knock him out for the rest of the year. But even with the loss of Manning, the Suns still went 22-13 and 13 the rest of the way, to finish with a 59-23 and 23 record. The first round brought a Portland Trailblazers team who were now without their franchise legend Clyde Drexler, as this was probably a relief for Phoenix, and Johnson was available and ready to play his usual elite level of playoff basketball. The Blazers had no answer for Barkley, as he put up nearly 32 per game on over 57% from the field in a three-game sweep, but Johnson would be second on the team with nearly 18 a game on a very efficient 56.7% to go along with nine assists as the Suns moved through to the second round, where they would get a rematch with Houston, who now featured the Blazers' former star. After four games, Phoenix looked to be well on their way to another conference finals appearance, as they were up 3-1, going back home for Game 5. But the Rockets would take Game 5, and then Game 6, to force a Game 7 in Phoenix. Johnson had been playing the best postseason series of his career, as he led the team with nearly 28 points per game on over 57% from the field and 50% from three as well as nearly 10 assists per game, and had scored at least 21 points in 4 of the 6 games, including 43 points on 75% shooting in a Game 4 win, and in Game 7, he would drop a postseason career high 46 points along with 10 assists, but he would be at the free throw line in the closing seconds of the game with the chance to give the Suns a 1 point lead. But after making 21 straight free throws this game, he would miss his 22nd, and after this, Mario Eli would hit the famous corner three, known as the kiss of death, to put the Rockets up three. Danny Ainge would get to the free throw line, but after making the first, his attempt to miss the second banked in, and even though he stole the Rockets inbound pass with about a second left, his last second heave was no good, and Houston won by one point to win the series. And this had been the Suns' last chance at a title, and it had ended in heartbreak. But for the regular season, Johnson averaged about 15.5 points, 7.5 assists, and a steal per game. The 96 season was a disappointment for the Suns. After a 14-19 and 19 start to the year, Westfall was let go and replaced by Fitzsimmons. Manning would return from his injury late in the year, and the Suns had also drafted Michael Finley during the offseason, who would be one of the top rookies in the league. Barkley played 71 games and still put up great numbers, but he was rarely playing at 100%. 
But then there was Johnson, who again was hampered by injuries all year and would miss 26 games. And the Suns would stumble to a 41-41 and record, but would still squeak into the playoffs. They would play San Antonio in the first round, and Johnson would again play well, finishing as the team's second leading scorer and top assist man, as he averaged a double-double and shot over 47% from the field. But they were without Finley, who had been injured on the final day of the regular season, and they would lose to the Spurs in four games. And Johnson's season ended with him averaging about 18.5 points, 9 assists, and 1.5 and steals per game. Okay, so this is where that Oliver Miller incident comes back into play. During the offseason, Johnson was going through diligent workouts to try and remedy the groin and abdominal issues he had been dealing with during the regular season. But then right before the start of training camp, Suns team doctors diagnosed Johnson with a hernia that he had been suffering from since mid-season, and had been a contributing factor to his variety of injuries. However, during surgery to repair this hernia, they discovered a second hidden hernia, which he had suffered years earlier, from, you guessed it, lifting up Miller. So finally the source of Johnson's injuries for his entire time with Barkley had been identified and repaired, and he was relatively healthy going into the 97 season. Unfortunately, a fully healthy Johnson never got a chance to play with Barkley, as he had been traded to Houston in the offseason, for a package including Sam Cassell and Robert Ory, and in their four years together, Johnson had ended up missing 109 regular season games. The Suns had also drafted a promising point guard in the 96 draft, named Steve Nash. Phoenix would be the opposite of a stable situation this season, but one player they could rely on was Johnson, as he played and started 70 games, averaging at least 20 points for the final time in his career. But after an 0-8 start, Fitzsimmons resigned and was succeeded by Danny Ainge, who had retired after the 95 season. Then with the Suns sitting at 8 and 19, they traded a package headlined by Cassell and Finley to the Mavs for Jason Kidd, and would now roll out a backcourt featuring two point guards. Additionally, they would trade Ori to reacquire Sabalos, who they had traded to the Lakers prior to the 95 season, and they were able to go 32 and 23 after the kid trade to finish 40 and 42, their first losing record in a decade. But it was still enough for a playoff berth, as they would draw the Sonics in the first round. The Suns were able to push Seattle to five games, thanks to a career series from Rex Chapman, but ultimately would lose in game five. Johnson would finish as the team's second leading scorer and distributor, but would have an uncharacteristically inefficient series, as he shot under 30% from the field and went 3 of 22 from deep. But Johnson's hernia-free season saw him average about 20 points and 9.5 and assists on nearly 50% from the field. The Suns made a big offseason move in trading for Antonio McDice prior to the 98 season, and had also signed free agent Clifford Robinson. And they had a solid bench unit featuring Steve Nash, who had made a big leap in year two, as well as sixth man of the year, Danny Manning. But an unexpected member of this unit was Johnson, as it was clear he didn't have too much left, as a knee injury sidelined him for a couple months, and he only ended up playing 50 games, starting just 12 of them, as he provided solid minutes and mentorship for Kidd and Nash, as the Suns had probably the most talented point guard rotation in the league. And all these changes helped, as the Suns surprisingly went 56 and 26, and would get a first round matchup with San Antonio. And even though Johnson had a shortened regular season, as usual, he was ready come playoff time. And although he would have a limited role, he would still play in every game and even start one of them, en route to averaging almost 14 points and five assists on nearly 55% shooting, as he would score at least 15 in three out of the four playoff games in a first round loss to San Antonio. And for the regular season, Johnson averaged about nine and a half points, three and a half rebounds, and five assists per game. And Johnson would retire after the season, ending an underrated and illustrious career. Oh, wait a second. Chance to speak with the Suns' Kevin Johnson. Despite having not played in the NBA since the 1998 playoffs, Johnson signed a contract on Thursday for the remainder of the season after Phoenix lost point guard Jason Kidd to a fractured ankle. The 2000 Suns featured their backcourt 2000 duo of Kidd and Penny Hardaway and had turned in a 53-29 and season which saw Kidd break his ankle in late March. So in hopes of salvaging their playoff chances, Johnson was asked if he would come out of retirement to help the Suns during their playoff run. And he did, as he would play in six regular season games before appearing in all nine of their playoff games. He would come off the bench in every game, yet he received solid minutes in the first round. But once Kidd returned in their second round loss to the Lakers, Johnson didn't see much action. And for his brief regular season, he put up about six and a half points and four assists on over 57% from the field. And now Kevin Johnson was permanently retired, 
as he had turned in one of the great underrated careers that saw him average over 20 points and 10 assists per game over a four-year stretch and have a remarkably efficient career for a 6'1 point guard shooting over 49% for his career. Johnson could have been stuck as a backup for years, but the trade during his rookie year gave him an opportunity, and while some may have crumbled from the immediate increase in responsibility, Johnson thrived and became one of the top point guards in the league for over a decade. The biggest shame in his playing career is the fact that he went years with an undiagnosed hernia, which if it was found and repaired early, could have led him to even more success. But even so, the most important time of every player's season is the playoffs, and Johnson was one of the best playoff performers in league history. But he just couldn't get over the hump, so it's tough to say if without the hernias, his postseason career would have turned out any differently. But regardless, Kevin Johnson brought an incredible mix of scoring and passing, and was able to get to the basket at will, but also possessed a great mid-range game which he often used by pulling up in transition. He was arguably the most important piece in the Suns' turnaround in the late 80s and will forever be a legend in Phoenix. And it's still baffling how little he comes up in the discussion of the all-time great point guards, because during his career, Kevin Johnson checked every box. But that's it for today's episode on KJ. Hope you enjoyed it and remember to subscribe for plenty more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this video on his 6th man of the year teammate or this one on a duo he spent half a season with as a rookie. Thanks for watching and see you next time.